Hello, and thank you so much for joining me for this presentation today. My name is Erin Roselle. I'm an assistant professor at St. John Fisher College. I teach courses in public relations in the Department of Media and Communication. And today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, behind the headlines, the National American Women's Suffrage Association Press Bureau. So uh, before we get started, I thought it would be helpful to provide a little bit of context. So I grew up in Geneva, New York in the Finger Lakes region, not far from Seneca Falls. And I teach in Rochester, which is home of the Susan B. Anthony House and Museum um, and where Susan B. Anthony spent much of her life. And so growing up, I had learned a lot about uh, the women's suffrage movement and um, you know, it was always something interesting to me. And because I lived in the area, when I started thinking about uh, my next research project to work on, I thought of the, the suffrage movement and I thought about, you know, their uses of public relations strategies. And so I began to look into it a little bit and I went to the Susan B. Anthony House, um, their website, where they had a timeline of events, and I noticed in 1898, they had this line that says, uh, Susan B. Anthony establishes a press bureau to feed articles on women's suffrage to the national and local press. And I thought, a press bureau? That's really interesting. I didn't know anything about that. And I knew that there you know, were a lot of PR and publicity strategies and tactics utilized like speeches and parades, um, banners, things like that. But I didn't know about a press bureau, which would indicate to me that there was um, a lot of strategy going on behind the scenes in terms of publicity. So this to me was fascinating and I wanted to look into it. So that kind of started things off. And to situate this into the context of what I study mostly, which is public relations, um, I'm not a historian um, and I don't teach courses in women's studies, um, but to situate the suffrage movement into the context of public relations history is really fascinating because most of our textbooks in public relations unfortunately talk about the development of modern public relations being led by men uh, and primarily white men. And so I looked at the timeline of the way that most of our books tell the history of public relations and they start in modern public relations in the 1800s talking about P.T. Barnum and the golden age of press agentry, this era of hype and celebrities. And then they talk about how the railroads helped drive the development of public relations and how communication is now linked to business objectives. And then move into uh, 1904 with Ivy Lee, who was known as a journalist who later um, worked in public relations and opened Parker and Lee, which is known as one of the early PR agencies. And then we move into Edward Bernays, who used social science and behavioral psychology. He was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he was famous for um, a campaign called Torches of Freedom, in which he um, got women interested in smoking cigarettes. Um, and he did a lot of other interesting things. And then uh, later on in the more you know, modern era, Arthur W. Page was the first vice president of corporate public relations and that was at AT&T. And so most of what the history of, of public relations talks about also is public relations in a business or corporate context, not in an activist or um, more social context. So I looked at the suffrage movement, which ran from about 1848 to 1920, and I thought, well, that is right here um, when the, you know, in the era of the early development of modern public relations. And I know that these women were using a lot of public relations strategies and tactics. And so why are they not in our textbooks and why do we not really talk about this? especially since uh, they were successful in achieving one of their objectives. And so I wanted to look into this a little bit more and I dove into some public relations history and some articles uh, written by 
more preeminent PR history scholars. And uh, one of them, Mart Martinelli, says that although often taken for granted, public relations is no doubt vital to facilitating social change. And I very much agree with this, and this helped me want to continue further understanding the Press Bureau. And so this first clip that I found was from the New York Times in 1897. And it said, uh, Women's Suffrage Press Bureau, and they, the National Women's Suffrage Association proposes to establish a press bureau in New York or in Washington, uh, DC, for the purpose of collecting and distributing to the press of the country acts and arguments in favor of the enfranchisement of women. This will be placed in charge of a practical and experienced newspaper woman with the needed assistance. To this end, the president, Susan B. Anthony, is issuing an appeal for $3,000, uh, which some will be necessary to carry out the plan. So $3,000 today is just under $100,000. And so she wasn't asking for a small amount of money. This indicated to me that she was really interested in putting together a formalized press bureau. I wondered if with that amount of money, they were planning to get you know, a, a really formal office to even pay some staff. And, um, and this, really kicked off what has now been a couple of years worth, several years worth of research to find more about the Press Bureau. So that first clip was about fundraising and certainly public fundraising utilizes um, persuasive tactics and uh, elements of public relations. And so um, that was a clear indication to me that they were, you know, knew a little bit about what they were doing. She placed an ad in the New York Times and was looking to raise some money and move this a little bit further. So by 1897, suffragists had already spent ample time, nearly 50 years, using PR strategies and tactics for the recruitment and the legitimacy of their cause. The development of the Press Bureau illustrates Susan B. Anthony's desire for a more strategic, coordinated, and women-led effort on a national scale in terms of publicity efforts. And she hoped to launch the Press Bureau in February of 1898 as part of the 50th anniversary of the start of the women's suffrage movement. And this uh, clip that I showed you proved that she was embarking on a fundraising effort to do so. Later, I found a letter from her in which she wrote that the age demands that we shall utilize the press of the country. We must have a national press bureau with a woman at its head who has not only the experience and ability, but the leisure and the disposition to give her whole time to reading the press clippings of the entire country and putting herself in communication with every editor who says a word for or against our movement. And this tells me that she knew that she needed someone that had media experience, um, who had the time and the, could put a lot of effort into this because she knew that running a press bureau, doing media relations, media monitoring um, would require a lot of time. And so she needed someone that would have the time to do it um, and the experience and ability as well. So in terms of fundraising for the Press Bureau, the letter on the left is from Susan B. Anthony to Rachel Foster Avery, who at the time was kind of like her right-hand woman, and they worked very closely together. And she was asking her some questions, what happened with the Jubilee Ball? I didn't find it in the Women's Journal. Um, and then later on, she says, I'm getting a little letter printed, begging money for a national Press Bureau. I will see what will come of it. And the other important thing to note here is that they're calling this the National Press Bureau because they had been doing publicity efforts and related things uh, on a localized level, but this National Press Bureau is you know, a coordinated effort um, on a national scale. And so uh, this letter that she's talking about begging for money is on the right. So they created this form letter, an appeal letter basically, uh, asking for your cooperation in a new department 
which the uh, National Women's Suffrage Association hopes to inaugurate at its 50th anniversary next February in Washington, a press bureau. Such has been the growth of public sentiment on the question of women's enfranchisement that it may now be regarded as one of the prominent issues of the day. There is no difficulty in securing ample space for its respectful consideration in the leading newspapers throughout the country. The only hindrance in the way of reaching millions of readers every week is the lack of a central office for collecting and distributing arguments and practical illustrations in its favor. The National Association, believing that this is now a most necessary work, proposes to establish a bureau for this purpose in New York or Washington City and to place it in charge of an experienced newspaper woman who will give it her entire time and effort. And in order to carry this out, we need at least $3,000. If you recognize its importance and you can make a contribution, could you please do so? Um, so again, this clearly states the need for a central office for collecting and distributing arguments and practical illustrations in uh, favor of the movement. So I found this very fascinating. So not only did they send this form letter, uh, Susan B. Anthony wrote her own letters to her own, you know, close networks and contacts. Uh, this one is asking one of her friends to ask her husband to donate $100 toward the press bureau. And um, basically goes on to say, you know, we've done a lot already. And I know he feels that the conditions of society for his daughters are vastly better today because of the agitation and education that's been carried on by our women. Um, so can you read him this paragraph and see if he does not say, yes, Hannah, I will do it at once. So Susan B. Anthony was very sharp in terms of public relations, publicity, media relations. And one of the really amusing things that I found throughout the course of my research is somewhat related to the Press Bureau, um, in which she is corresponding with Rachel Foster Avery. And this letter on the left talks about um, this letter, the, the letter on the left is actually from Rachel to Susan P. Anthony saying that she heard from Mrs. Harper that um, you don't like the immense sleeves on uh, the photo of me that you're putting in your book. So this was during the time that they were writing the history of the suffrage movement and Susan B. Anthony was collecting photos of the most important women as part of the movement to be included in the book volumes. And um, basically, Rachel heard from Mrs. Uh, Harper that Susan B. Anthony didn't like her photo. She had these immense sleeves and the she didn't like the expression on her face. But Rachel is saying, I don't have the time or the money to get this photo retaken. So either use it or don't include me in my in your book uh, is basically what she's saying. And um, and then on the right, because Susan was rather persuasive, uh, replied, of course, I must have your picture in my book and I want Harriet Purvis's also. And why don't you go with her and you can both get your pictures retaken because I don't like the pose that you were in and your face doesn't have a natural expression. So I would much rather pay for a new picture of each of you than put in the one that you sent me. Um, yours doesn't have the best expression and I want you to keep at it until the artist catches your very best look. And this is even after Rachel sort of suggests that she can vignette the photo to remove the sleeves and isn't this photo even better than the other one that I had with this enormous pompadour on my head. <laughs> and the whole correspondence is amusing because I read this and I thought that this correspondence could be something that happens today, you know. Um, I don't like the picture you have. We're gonna be using this publicly for public relations purposes. This photo needs to accurately represent who you are and represent the movement. You know, you're gonna to need to have a different one taken. And, uh, and so I can see this exact same thing happening today. So, um, but Susan B. Anthony knew that the history that they were writing would be really important and would be seen by a lot of people. And so Rachel's photo would be an important part of it and she wanted everyone to look appropriate. So 
uh, in a letter on November 3rd, 1897, Susan B. Anthony wrote, uh, she had been traveling a lot for conferences uh, and said, this trip has made me feel more than ever that the age demands that we shall utilize the press of the country. And uh, that there is no use in relying upon the state associations to secure an efficient woman, not only to do the state work, but one in each county for local work. We must have a national press bureau with a woman at its head who not only has the experience and ability, but the leisure and the disposition to read the press clippings of the entire country and put herself in communication with every editor who says a word for or against our movement. And again, she's talking about raising the money necessary to do it. And that if we push this matter now, while Mrs. Harper is at her leisure before she gets herself fastened in some new business, we can get her for that place and for less than anyone else would possibly undertake uh, it for. So, you know, she, Susan B. Anthony, again, recognized the role and the importance of the media in changing public opinion, persuasion, um, and knew that she could utilize the press of the country to advance her cause. So although Anthony was a skilled fundraiser, she wasn't able to secure the money needed to establish the press bureau before her death, but her desire for a headquarters in a large city center from which news of all kinds was sent to four quarters of the globe would be realized with the opening of the National Press Bureau in 1909. Um, in a report by Ida Harper in 1910, she writes that my strong belief that New York offered the greatest and most promising field in the world for suffrage press work has been abundantly sustained. The National Press Bureau was opened about the middle of September in 1909, soon after the national headquarters were moved to the city with a private reception to the representatives of every newspaper in the city to whom its objects and hopes were stated. So I'm taking that to mean objectives. Um, and uh, this tells me that the women of the Press Bureau and uh, the National American Women's Suffrage Association engaged in objective setting. They engaged in media relations efforts, uh, reports saying that you know the men and women reporters have been its unfailing friends. Media monitoring, they reviewed 16 New York City based newspapers and filed the related clippings on an ongoing basis. In five months, they clipped over 3,000 articles on women's suffrage, ranging in length from a paragraph to a page. They read, sorted, and filed over 10,000 clippings over five months from a news service bureau from papers outside of New York City, including 2,300 editorials. And about 100 magazine articles on women's suffrage had been published and uh, according to the history, it's doubtful if there was such a record in all the preceding 10 years combined. And in, from 1911 onward, they engaged in systematic and business-like methods. So once the Press Bureau was up and running, which it was on Fifth Avenue in New York City, so they decided to um, locate themselves in New York City, I think primarily because that's where most of the major newspapers and magazines had their headquarters, so it made sense for that purpose. Um, and they also were able to open the press bureau thanks to some uh, wealthy benefactors. So the National Press Bureau got up and running in 1911 and their work increased in both quality and quantity. They continued their media relations efforts now even on an international scale. So incoming media requests from newspapers and magazines came from across the globe uh, as well as nearly every state in the United States. And they increased work with syndicates like the Associated Press, who had sent out suffrage news and solicited the cooperation of the Press, press Bureau. So this indicates that they were not only pushing their news out, they were now receiving media requests from reporters and journalists globally. And, um, and then working with syndicates like the Associated Press would help land them in um, publications in, on an international scale. So from 1912 onward, according to um, their own reporting, they moved what we from what we would call a publicity to a public information model. So 
Um, in 1911, California passed Proposition 4, which granted women right to vote. And then that win, coupled with changes in the media landscape, moved the work from of the National Press Bureau from the publicity model to a public information model. So basically, it moved them from, we are trying to push this news out to publications, more to responding to requests for information. And so they were handling a lot more incoming media requests and it would be a lot more of just providing information than let's say attempting to persuade journalists and uh, reporters to cover their news. So as the suffragists worked toward a federal amendment, the work of the, uh, the National Press Bureau was escalated by the movement's momentum and New York gained suffrage in 1917 and in 1919, the Senate passed the 19th Amendment. On August 26, 1920, three quarters of the state legislatures ratified the 19th Amendment and women won full voting rights. So the development of the National Press Bureau demonstrates that the National American Women's Suffrage Association engaged in things that are hallmarks of public relations efforts. They were working on objective setting. So they knew, cl clearly knew what they wanted to achieve um, as a result of their media outreach and publicity efforts. They engaged in extensive media monitoring media relations work and media outreach. So media monitoring, you know, following the newspapers, clipping at, at that time, they were physically clipping out the stories to monitor what was being said about the movement. They were engaging in media relations efforts. So developing relationships with members of the media in an effort to secure positive coverage of the movement and uh, engaging in media outreach. So sharing the news of the movement with members of the media on a regular and ongoing basis. And so all of these things were fascinating to me because it was just something that I had never uh, known about the, that they were doing on a really formalized level. So Susan B. Anthony herself had a really keen understanding and appreciation of the role of the media in shaping public opinion. Her efforts to develop a press bureau highlight the movement's use of planned strategic and ongoing communication efforts in support of their cause. And it's been a real pleasure to share this information with you. Here are some of my references. And of course, if you have any questions um, or would like to learn more about the research that I'm doing, please drop me a line. And um, thank you again so much for inviting me to present. And I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the National Press Bureau.